There are many ways people listen to Vision, including in cars through the Vision app. The Vision app is compatible with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. So if you have mobile coverage, you can stream any of Vision's live radio channels in crystal clear quality and enjoy a growing range of on-demand podcasts all on the go. There are other ways to connect your phone to your vehicle speakers too. You can see detailed instructions when you Google ways to listen to Vision. However and wherever you listen to Vision, you can be sure that the announcers, programs and music will help you look to God daily. A biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. Well, on a Thursday, we do like to check in with Christian social commentator David Robertson. He's back with us. He's, these days, Minister of Scots Kirk Presbyterian Church in Newcastle in New South Wales. And so many people are absolutely astounded and amazed with his great writing at his blog called The We Flee. David Robertson, a special welcome back to 2020. Yeah, it's uh, good to be with you again, and I'm glad... uh you were saying that you have experts coming on. Well, I'm not one of the experts. But. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, always appreciate your insights because you're one of these sort of GP types across a lot of different areas and uh, offering all sorts of tremendous wisdom to think biblically about things. So if we're Christians here, David, and thinking about talking about one of the other world religions, we're talking Islam, uh, you're making a differentiation between Islam and Islamism and the sort of fear that uh, has been developed around some of that called Islamophobia. Uh, where do you want to start with this? Um, I think it, it, it's important for Christians to understand this. So when I was when I lived in Scotland, I had Muslim neighbours. In fact, when I lived in, in North Sydney, I had Muslim neighbours. And uh, a lot of Christians don't realise how much Muslims vary. Now, Islamism is a political philosophy, and it believes that Islamic values, Sharia law, should be imposed on every society. Um, they reject Western principles, which largely come from Christianity, such as freedom of opinion, freedom of the press, artistic freedom, and freedom of religion. So, Islamism is a political ideology. You could say that Islam is primarily a religion. Although, to be fair, I think we need to point out that the distinction between politics and religion, most Muslims would not recognize. In other words, they're very holistic. I would argue that Christians should be holistic as well. But a, a, a Muslim would never consider this concept of that we have of separation of church and state. Um, to, to be a Muslim, you ultimately want an Islamic society. So I do think that it's important for us to understand uh, what is going on and how we respond to it with nuance. I mean, our, our aim is to present the gospel to Muslims, but we also need to be aware of the effect of, of a society becoming Islamic or significantly influenced by Islam because it will mean less freedom for the gospel. I cannot think of a single Muslim country where people are free, for example, to change from Islam to Christianity. It's a powerful comment to make when you say the difference there. And oftentimes yeah. we're interested in, aren't we, the difference between Christianity and Islamism uh, is that our freedoms that we have experienced uh, will come out of our Christianity, um, but there are no such freedoms under Islamism. And uh, this is the challenge, isn't it? Things that are developing around the world, and you've written an article just recently, uh, primarily around things that are developing in the UK. And as I mentioned uh, a little earlier, the thought that maybe some of these things might be just around the corner or on our doorstep here in Australia. How do you think the UK is just a little ahead of where we might be as Aussies? So there's been a lot of stuff happening in the UK. I mean, some of it I've been aware of personally over the years. Uh, I've only been on Australia for five years. Um, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, it really was quite extraordinary. The House of Commons, the Speaker of the House of Commons, changed the normal procedure 
because of the threat of violence over Gaza, which was largely coming from Islamists. Um, and that threat of violence, uh, there have been almost 100 people killed in the UK by Islamists. Uh, I know that there are people, there are certain things that you cannot and would not do. And ironically, one of the things that's happening is there's this new sin or crime of Islamophobia. Now, the trouble is almost nobody's able to define what it is. And there are some people, the definition of Islamophobia that most of the political parties have signed up to, although not the Conservative Party yet, is one which would preclude any criticism of Islam whatsoever, um, which is extraordinary because it becomes a new blasphemy law. So that, that's one of the things that's occurring. In other words, people can satirize and attack Christianity, but if you were to criticize Islam, you would be breaking the law. And I, I, I find that astonishing. And I think Australia may be heading that route as well. Uh, this thought uh, that it's not really something you even put on paper, a de facto blasphemy law, and uh, mm-hmm. oftentimes we'll think of the physical sense when we think of a Islamic-run uh, nation or where you've got not only uh, Islam in charge but mob rule on the streets. And uh, I wonder if you've got any thoughts here. If you talk about a de facto blasphemy law, this is something that can affect people who are either Muslim or not, but uh, Islamic, uh, Islamophobia seems to have this effect on people. Uh, any thoughts yeah. here around you know this, this connection between a, a, this de facto blasphemy law? Yeah, so I, I actually know some Muslims who are very glad to, to get out of an Islamic country because they wanted more freedom. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm saying I don't want to talk in general terms. However, we had an incident here in Australia which illustrates just what you've just said. So when the New South Wales government wanted to uh, express some sympathy for Israel because of the attack that killed 1,700 people, most brutal attack in, in October, they decided to project the Israeli flag onto the Sydney Opera House. And uh, there were some Jews who wanted to obviously to go into town and see that, but the police asked them not to because there was going to be a counter demonstration, which was largely an Islamist one. And that's the infamous one where um, there's supposed to have been shouts of gas the Jews, although there's some dispute about that, but there were certainly chants of where are the Jews and then other things about the Jews. Uh, and I just found it astonishing that in Australia, Jews were being told, don't go into the city centre. And and instead of people being prosecuted who were threatening them, the people who were being threatened were being told to stay away. Indeed, I believe there was even one man who was arrested for having an Israeli flag, whereas people were waving Palestinian flags and chanting, where are the Jews or death to the Jews or whatever. Um, so that's where the mob rule aspect of it comes in. And then there's been this really weird thing that it's really hard to understand, and I'm trying to get my head around it. And it's that progressives and Islamists have basically become allies. Now, that is really strange, because let's say, for example, you're progressive, you're all for Mardi Gras and gay rights and trans rights and so on. Hey, forget that in an Islamic society. And yet, the two are so tied together. One of the strangest things I've seen is queers for Gaza. Well, you try to be gay in Gaza and see what happens to you. You know, it's just really quite extraordinary. So I think all of this is going on. It's, it's great confusion within our culture and in our society. And sometimes the Christian response is lacking in, in at least two ways. First of all, I think it's um, we can be too fearful of Islam. We shouldn't be afraid, fearful, because we know that Christ is is greater. But secondly, we can be too compromising and we can go along with the Islamic agenda. And uh, I, I think we need to accept that Muslims need Jews, need Jesus. <laughs> Muslims need Jews here. Yeah. Muslims need Jesus as much as uh Anybody else, you know, professing Christians, people who profess to be Christian but are not, also need Christ. So, so for me, that that's hugely significant. And and yet, I am concerned that we're going to get to a point where uh, even ha- us having conversations like this would be illegal. 
So you've got this thought that nobody wants to blame Islam for the challenges that the world is facing. And I know that in your latest article, you've said that even the establishment would rather talk about the danger of Islamophobia rather than the dangers that are being presented in Islamism, even though those are in the news headlines around the world. Any thoughts here about, you know, one word uh, rather than the actions being uh, being talked about? Oh, yeah, it's sheer cowardice as well as stupidity. I mean, the in Britain, the all-party parliamentary group, I've just got it here, the definition of Islamophobia is a type of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. Now, first of all, Islam is not a race. Uh, that's incredibly important. I mean, Who's going to argue that being anti-Christian means you're a racist? That would be a very, very interesting argument. But it's, a, it, it's, a, it, it's an extraordinary thing that we're, we're getting to this. Um, so I do think that... Uh, how will I put it? See, people think, oh, don't be ridiculous. There's no danger um, from Islam in the UK because only... 8% of the population are Muslim. Actually, I think once you've got around 10% of a society that is Muslim, then that changes the society profoundly. And I don't blame the Muslims for this, by the way, but it's just that their religion is is so consistent in, in, in this. So I remember in my own city back in Scotland, in Dundee, I went to visit a mosque on a Monday night. I was giving a talk there and... Um, 300 young men, and that's one of five mosques. I couldn't think of a single church where you would get 100 young men uh, on a Monday night or whatever. So I, I think that you start getting things like Sharia law in Islamic areas, a de facto Sharia law, and that spreads out across society in some ways. And politicians then just become scared. They don't want to alienate. They don't want to be accused of Islamophobia and they don't want to alienate a significant part of the electorate. So where you have what you might call an enclave uh, or suburbs, where, of course, you might think that like-minded people might gather and mix and live and have the freedom to live out their religion, but where you've got that, you've got an intensity uh, which actually then begins to undermine some of the uh, right uh, freedoms that uh, that you might experience, uh, say, even in a nation like Australia. Uh, what happens, do you think, David, uh, when you get that certain level? And you mention a, a figure, say, 10%. Uh, maybe it's less than that. Maybe it's more. But, um, you know, what happens to a society when you've got the influence that comes from these groups as they have the ear of the government, have the ear of the bureaucracy, have the ear of the police that won't touch anything that is wrong behaviour. Where do you think those things head? Oh, I, th I think it heads to disaster because I think it ends up, you end up with a kind of apartheid system. So there are some suburbs of Sydney, for example, where I used to live, um, I mean, there were great suburbs for me, uh, but but it was it was like going to the Middle East, uh, and it's very difficult. I mean, I, back in Scotland, I remember one girl who I I don't think I'll even name the country, which shows you how dangerous it is. Who came from an Asian country, who was Muslim, who was converted, and ended up having to go into police protection uh, because the local community. Asian community, Muslim community, uh, her, her life would actually have been in danger. And that, that was an extraordinary thing in a 21st century Scotland. I remember baptizing an Iranian man and being conscious of the enormous cost to him of that and the danger that he was putting himself into. Um, at that time, and I think it is still the case, but I can't imagine it being any different, but there was a police unit that was especially dedicated to protecting Muslims who changed, who'd converted to something. Um, and you get people like, I mean, ever since Salman Rushdie and others, you've had to live with police protection. It's, it's, it's extraordinary. Uh, and there's a danger of that happening here. Uh, I've seen people uh, on the streets 
calling for things that if you or I called for them, we would rightly go to jail, but somehow they get away with it. And that does bother me that you end up with two standards of justice, two standards of education, uh, two standards of law. And it's profoundly dangerous for a society. If you want to see what happens, just look at France, look at what's occurred in Sweden, look at what's going on in Germany. Um, it, it, it is, it's an enormous danger. So I, I found it, I mean, in my city back in Scotland, the Muslims there were great. They were, they were a very much a minority and we all got, as far as I'm concerned, we all got on fine. But I think it's when it reaches a tipping point uh, and they become ghettos and they become Isla- becomes Islamic law, then it becomes very dangerous. You draw attention to a documentary that was made called Undercover Mosques and yeah. uh, it uncovered a whole lot of things that ought to have been dealt with by authorities, but... You say that instead of dealing with the actual hate uh, from the hate preachers, um, in the case that you quote, the West Midlands Police and the Crown Prosecution Service attacked the documentary Mm -hmm. makers rather than deal with the issues that were raised. Any thoughts here? Because this seems to be something that's fairly common, uh, that when authorities get a hold of things, uh, they'll try and shut down the one who is alerting perhaps a public to a danger and protecting those that are actually putting the public in danger. Any thoughts here? Yeah, sure. So in 2007, this program was done by Channel 4, which is very progressive left wing, and it uncovered homophobia, anti-Semitism, anti-democracy stuff in uh, some mosques in the West Midlands. And instead of the police dealing with that, they ended up, Uh, accusing the documentary makers of basically Islamophobia. Now, in 2008, Channel 4 were vindicated uh, with a public apology, and they got a six-figure libel sum. But I'll I'll tell you this, you'll not see any more programs like that. It it works very effectively. And I think here in Australia, you know, I think, is it now three or four programs that the ABC have done uh, on private schools, the latest one being on Cranbrook. And, you know, fair enough, they want to do those programs. But ask yourself this, would would they ever do a series on Islamic schools? I doubt it. I really doubt it. Because they don't want to be accused of Islamophobia and because of the perception that to, to critique Islam is itself to be racist. Let's talk about how we might think about these things as Christian believers. So whether you're just leading your family or you might be in some sort of leadership in your community, uh, the answer, uh, where do we find an answer as to how Christians think about these sorts of issues? And as we're navigating our way forward with our own families and in the organizations and the businesses and the uh, the churches that we're a part of. Well, the, the, fir- the first thing for me is really, really simple. Uh, and it, 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 it's, um, it's almost a cliche, but the first thing we genuinely need to do is love our Muslim neighbors. And to love your Muslim neighbor means that you want them to hear about Christ. So look to support churches. Nor I used to work for um, evangelism and new church. In fact, I'm, I'm still with them until uh, all my visa stuff is sorted out. But, you know, they have people who work amongst Muslims. There are other people who work amongst Muslims. And our, our desire, we, we, we shouldn't have a, pho- a phobia about a fear of Islam. But I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is that we do need to be aware of the dangers that are involved as well. And at a political level and at a cultural level, we uh, need to try and encourage people to avoid the ghettoization of, of Muslims. Or, and we need to point out the, the hypocrisy of claiming that being anti-Muslim is racist, but being anti-Christian is fine. Uh, there's that kind of thing. And I would suggest we, we learn some stuff about Islam. So there's a guy in Australia called Sam Green. I'll just give you one example. He's absolutely brilliant uh, talking about how through the Bible you can explain to Muslims um, what the gospel is. Uh, Most of my Muslim acquaintances and friends uh, haven't really a clue what the Bible actually teaches. 
And I think we need to do that. And also, by the way, Neil, I, I think this in terms of your radio show and so on. I remember driving through Sydney if I was preaching somewhere on a Sunday evening. I was coming back and uh, I would pick up two or three Islamic stations. And sometimes if the preaching was not in Arabic, but in English, man, it was incredibly strong. The sort of stuff I think you and I would get cancelled for sometimes. But, you know, as I flick through the radio stations, I, I got a, maybe one radio station with some Christian music or whatever. Um, I just got the impression that w there was more proclamation of Islam on the airwaves than there was of Christianity. And I'm just thinking, no, this is not right. So, again, I would say support Christian media because... I suspect you're not going to get secular media proclaiming the gospel and Muslims need to hear the gospel. And one of the best ways for them to hear is through media and Internet and all the rest of it. Well, there's a challenge, isn't there? Because uh, we'll often be uh, calling those who are listening uh, to be as supportive of, you know, the, the new uh, expansion or those things that we're doing to grow and to be more of an influence in Australia. And so uh, we'll take that as a, a gentle encouragement from you, David. So uh, wonderful to hear that. Time has run out. I know that some listeners might want to read the article we're talking about today. It's Christian Today uh, that has published this article. Is that, uh, is that where people can find a copy? Yeah, so um, Christian Today, it's very interesting. It was, uh, both articles are very popular. I, I did called it Islamism in Britain, part one, part two. And uh, uh, it was their number one and number two articles for a whole week. But I, it's probably easier to go on to, to my blog now, www.theweeflee.com, and you'll get it there. But if, I think if you just type, typed in Islam in, in, Brit in Britain to Google, it will come up. Um, and I'd be interested to get readers' feedbacks. And, sorry, I should also say this, that if there are any Muslims who are happening to be listening to this, I, I, I do want to say that I love speaking with Muslims because I'll tell you this, unlike many of my secular brothers and sisters, you are very, very happy to discuss religion and God and Jesus and everything else. And, uh, you know, if you're a Muslim, why don't you find a Christian to have a genuine and open discussion with? It's You, you may find it enlightening, and we would certainly find it enlightening. So to connect with David Robertson, theweflee.com. And, of course, uh, last time we were talking, uh, we know that that nickname came from atheist Richard Dawkins, uh, who thought that David was an irritation uh, in his expression of Christian truth. Uh, theweflee.com. Uh, David also writes for newspapers, magazines. He's the author of a number of books, including The Dawkins Letters and Engaging with Atheists. His latest book is called Seek theweflee.com. David, thanks so much for another great insight today on 2020. Thank you. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.